and we're live. Welcome to the Sunday session. My name is Steve Judge. I'm your host for the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners around the world. Um, today I'm joined by three guys at the top of their game. We've got Richard Bredis, is a performance analyst at Anderlecht. We've got Serge Van Ban, is a first team goalkeeper coach and their set piece guru. Seems to be the way that the, the goalkeeping coaches are becoming experts uh, uh, and when it comes to set pieces, uh, possibly Mads Budgerite, who uh, is an assistant coach now at Denmark under 18s and under 20s, will give a, a different view on that. Um, but before we get to that, let me uh, share my screen with you and uh, give you an overview of uh, what today's discussion is going to look like. Here we go. So yes, how to analyze, create and coach set pieces. So uh, first half of the show, we'll be sort of looking at the, the, the sort of key elements of, of a set piece. So after the guys have given their presentations, we'll sort of begin the discussion by looking at you know, what are the main things that they they look at when one sort of analyzing, dissecting set pieces and then creating those set pieces that they're looking to take advantage of and score from. Um, and in the second half is more of the, the, the coaching process then, how, how the guys go about doing that, how that having taken all that information, the analysis and putting together their plans, how those plans come into action. And obviously we'll have Richard, it's probably a, the dark arts of how they're going about dissecting those, again, those, those set pieces, how they go about stopping them. Uh, and finally, then we're sort of looking at the, the role of technology in terms of how that is analyzed and, and also how it's being increasingly used in, uh, in putting together set pieces and, and working on individual player techniques. Um, but so we can have that discussion. Let me uh, start introducing you to today's guests. Um, I'll begin with, uh, with Mads Butgerite. Uh, Mads, how are you? Uh, it's snowing where I am. It's surprising you're in, in Denmark. You look as if you're, you're in, a, a, in summertime. Uh, thanks. I'm fine in Denmark. Uh, the weather here is about zero degrees. So, you know, like it's a pretty normal winter here. We don't have uh, ice. We don't have snow. It's just cold and nothing else. Um, I would prefer it, it would be you know, like snowing or, or having it warm, but not that in between. But that's the way it is here. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's because you're in the, you're in the summer house. It's giving that impression of yeah, you're somewhere somewhere nice and warm. And yeah, I'm in a summer house. Like I said before, it's it's nice. We're having a pool and a spa. And of course, my warm up for today's session was being in the in the warm bath and uh, relaxing a little bit. So I'm Perfect. on fire now. Perfect. Yeah, I'm sort of jealous of you. I think I had to make do with just a hot cup of tea. Uh, just wondered. Yeah, for now we could. Uh, just for now, just to share with the guy, with the with the audience, your your sort of background and your your pathway in football to, to where you are now. Yes, it started uh, like yeah, 15 years ago. Um, I became a, a youth coach. Started with under 13, and under 14, and and then the way up to to the senior level. Uh, my passion for set pieces. It uh, was clear that when Didier Drogba scored in the Champions League final. He was man-marked by, I think, Philip Lahm. Um, he scored in the 90-plus minute. I think I remember that in that game, uh, FC Bayern Munich, they had 20 corner kicks. Chelsea got one, and he scored. And after that, it was clear to me that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to look into set pieces and, and find out what is, what is in it and why it's not so common that teams are scoring a lot of goals um, on set pieces. And then I, I made a change. I came from Olbo um, and then moved to FC Mitulan. And I was pretty lucky because Matthew Benham, he, uh, he came into the club together with uh, Rasmus Angersen. And uh, they were very interested in bringing um, set pieces to another level. Another level. Um, and then there was a set piece lounge. I moved, or I, I, I became a part of it. 
And then after the assistant from the first team, Dean Priske, he moved to Copenhagen. Then there was a little opening for me. And I was so lucky to get a, with the first team on a training camp in Dubai um, to train set pieces and to explain ideas together with another assistant coach. And then I did that for two and a half years and uh, we became uh, Danish champions and uh, won the trophy. And then I took a break after winning the trophy um, and became a part of the Danish FA under 18, uh, under 20 as assistant coach. That's where I am now and uh, yeah. Thanks Mats, yes. Um, yeah, looking forward to, to hearing more about your, your work on the, on the training ground with, with set pieces. Uh, a guy who's been, been very busy this season on the training ground is uh, Serge Van den Ban uh, at Elmere City. Uh, and a good win for your guys on Friday, I believe. Yeah, it was a great win. We won 3-0, uh, scored another goal out of a set piece, a corner kick. Yeah, so very pleased with that. Yeah, it's fun to yeah, share your, your sort of footballing pathway that sort of led you to Almere City. Um, yeah, I started, I'm a former goalkeeper, uh, played in championship for about 250 games, uh, stopped early when I was 28, uh, went into coaching as a goalkeeper coach, um, mainly worked with youth, uh, worked at uh, Ajax, Utrecht, AZ, Dutch national team under 15 and under 17, uh, worked three years for Arsenal, and then uh, I went into senior football, went to RKC, played in the championship, uh, promoted that year. A year later, played Eredivisie, uh, and then, uh, yeah, the start uh, of this season, I started at Almere City, who are, uh, uh, yeah, in championship, uh, in the top of the league, uh, as a goalkeeper coach, uh, all the way I was a goalkeeper coach, and uh, in Holland, it's very common that yeah, goalkeeper coaches uh, do the set pieces. So, uh, and uh, yeah, it was very interesting for me to do it and uh, try to read a lot of articles, uh, look everything up and uh, try to do better and improve it every every day. Yeah, fantastic. So yeah, I'm just looking forward to finding out a bit more why so you're not alone. Clearly you said everyone in Holland and I sort of know a lot of clubs in England where yeah, the goalkeeper coach is the one who's who's doing all the set pieces. Maybe the reasons for that are possibly obvious. Um, and finally, uh, Richard Bredis, performance analyst at, at Anderlecht. Um, yeah, Richard, I wonder if you jump in and, and share us a bit of your of your pathway as a, as an analyst. Yeah, more than everyone. So um, obviously, I guess like most of us, the the dream was to become a professional footballer. Um, I spent two years as an apprentice at Lincoln City, who were in League Two in England at the time. Uh, got as high as reserve level, and then after that, obviously, that was that was the end of the dream. I didn't didn't make it as a pro, unfortunately. So um, I ended up back at university. I did a sports science degree, and it was only in my second year at uni that I actually even had, I'd not even heard of analysis before that point. Um, so I started to do a bit of voluntary work with uh, Nottingham Forest ladies at the time. And then thankfully, when I finished my degree, um, I got an internship with uh, Reading Football Club, in the, who was in the Premier League that season. Um, so I spent the year with Reading. And then as that season came to an end, um, I applied for a few jobs. And, and quite unbelievably, I ended up getting a job at Manchester City, where I spent the next um, six years working with the first team there. Um, and then, yeah, for the last couple of years, obviously, as uh, Vincent Company moved to be managed, become manager of Anderlecht, um, I decided that I wanted to you know, go and try in, in a different league and have a, a bit of a change of direction. And I'm now working with him as, as, as his first team analyst. All right. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I'll leave the, the floor to you then, Richard. I think we'll, we'll start with the analysis aspect of, uh, of today's uh, Sunday session. So, yeah, that okay. screen's all yours, Richard. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I touched on it very briefly there in terms of, of my journey, but in terms of, of, of badges, if you want to lay it out, that's kind of, how I've been, as I say, I was a I was a goalkeeper as well uh, while I was a player at Lincoln. Obviously, as a youth team player, and then as I obviously started to fall out of football in terms of trying to be a player, um, as I say, I went to Loughborough and did a sports science degree, and that was where I got my first experience doing um, actual analysis with uh, Nottingham Forest ladies. Um, you know, just very basic stuff to start off with, filming game, coding games, but 
you know, it was my first experience of doing it. And that really gave me the passion that, you know, that was what I wanted to do in my career. Um, <clears throat> so I spent the year with uh, Reading, uh, working as an unpaid intern there. That was a season they were in the Premier League. Um, and again, obviously, it was fantastic to get the first experience of, of working at a Premier League club, seeing how the analysis works and, you know, really getting a chance to, you know, to, to get into the industry. Um, and then I guess, yeah, the biggest part of my career as an analyst was spent at City. Um, so obviously spent six years there, had an absolutely unbelievable, you know, probably the, the most rich period of their, of their history in terms of winning trophies and, you know, being at the very top of our game. Um, and also getting to see some of the very best managers working as well was absolutely incredible in terms of, you know, for my development and, and understanding of, of, of how football works. And then, as I say, I get to, get to now, whereas going into the second season with Anderlecht, um, working with Vincent Company, again, another fantastic young manager who I've got absolutely no doubt is going to have a very, very good management career. So as we get to the set pieces, I guess I could have come into this presentation and, and done the usual thing of showing, well, you know, look, here's an example when we said this team was weak at defending the front post and here's a scoring a goal at the front post. But I thought, well, I've done that enough in the past, so I'm going to go the opposite way and show you how actually... Um, going into the derby against United a couple of years ago, we had the chance to win the league against Manchester United, um, playing at home in front of our fans. Um, and we were 2 0 up at half time, and we actually ended up losing the game 3 2. We won the league, but obviously, you know, it would have been nice to do it against United. And we actually conceded the third goal from a set piece that was detail that, you know, that we'd identified. So I guess the whole point of that was, as it says on the screen, that detail is key, but at the end of the day, we can have all this good work on the pitch, but sometimes it's going to come down to the execution of players, you know, to execute a game plan or an instruction when it comes to the pitch. So what I mean by that is, so we before the game, we'd highlighted um, the threat of Chris Smalling from set pieces. And also we'd looked at the last few times that we played against Man United and we'd identified that all of their wide free kicks had been delivered to our back post. So the combination of the threat of free kicks was that their delivery towards the back post and Chris Smalling's threat in terms of how many shots and first contacts he'd had. So if I roll the video on, I'm sure you guys know what's going to come next. As I say, this was a chance for us to win the league at home against Man United. We're defending a wide free kick. We can see the goal from Chris Smalling at the back post. So I guess the reason I wanted to show that in a slightly different way was, as I say, you know, we, we'd highlighted the information and we kind of done our analysis. But at the end of the day, it's up to those guys on the pitch. have got to execute, you know, the information and, and take things on board and things happen in football matches um so you know sometimes best laid plans can can come undone so yeah that's just a very short uh, bit of information about me and a little bit of an insight into opposition analysis and obviously we'll go into it in, in more detail as the uh, as the conversation goes on okay yeah thanks for that richard yeah we'll <clears> certainly <throat> get into a bit more detail of yeah sort of how how you go about dissecting set pieces and, and those clubs that you you're clearly identifying as doing some great work on the training ground with their set pieces. Um, and one of those we believe is uh, Almere City. So uh, I shall bring up Serge yep. and uh, share sort of your, your processes uh, on the training ground to uh, putting those set pieces together. Yeah, so set pieces. This was uh, from last season when I was at RKC against Feyenoord. I think it's a nice picture. So uh, I started new at Almere City. So for me in preseason, it's about analyzing your own team, your individual strengths and weaknesses. So you know, um, yeah, what what they can do and um, and use their strengths and and know what they don't want. Uh, some players. Um, I talk individual with players as well. So what are the preferences of a player? So um, for example, uh, this season I had a player. He said, okay, um, I've got a good kick. I've got a good delivery, but out swinging, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable if I have to do an out swinging uh, corner kick. Um, so I note all that down. Um, yeah, to use them. Uh, in, in set pieces, uh, what they can and what they can't do. So, and then at the start of the season, um, we did, I had a discussion with the team and, and discussion with the individual players. 
Um, and then I put down the basic principles for set pieces, attacking and defensively. Um, and hereby I tell them as well, okay, if we do, for example, we do sonar marking, um, this is a, a threat. Uh, if the opponent does this, uh, that can happen. And that's how we can concede goals. So we have to be conscious uh, that that can happen and, uh, and give them uh, yeah, an idea as well how to solve it. In preseason, every week, we had a full session uh, about set pieces, uh, and that could be uh, everything. So uh, could be for corners, could be free kick from the side or a direct free kick, or uh, we did one session on throw-ins, not only the long throw-in, but also in, on, in the middle of the pitch, uh, on our own half, uh, kickoff. Uh, we, we did uh, basically everything what's in there, we, we practiced. So during a week, match day plus one, we have an evaluation of the last mark match. So uh, I tell them uh, maybe we did everything right or maybe we can do things better. Uh, what were the threats of the opponent? And uh, also why do they do that? Uh, so why do they come, for example, near post? Did we leave too much space? Uh, we were not in the good positions. Uh, match day minus one, uh, I always give a, a presentation about the opponent's set pieces. So what are their threats? Uh, uh, where are the chances for us? Uh, individual players, uh, who's, who's good at ha heading the ball? Who's, who's going to score a goal? Uh, how do they set up timing of runs? Everything. After that, so at the end of the presentation, uh, I send away the subs. Uh, and I give them some sheets, how the opponent set up. Uh, so we do it always 11 v 11. Um, then uh, the players who's gonna play sit down and then I explain them the set pieces we're gonna train uh, during the practice. So on a match day, all the sheets are in the changing room. Uh, there are always some players who's got questions. So I, I, I take care that I'm uh, in the changing room and try to ask them as well if everything's clear or do they have any questions. And during the game, yeah, of course you have to adapt to the opponent. Some opponents will um, evaluate us as well. So maybe they do something different than we expect. Uh, and yeah, we have to adapt to that. And uh, of course, informing the subs when they come on. So this is uh, a footage of the training. Uh, we're gonna play a game against Goat Eagles. Uh, I knew um, you see at the top, I don't know if you see my curse, cursor, but at the top there, there's one player out. There are two players in. Uh, they play the ball, play a short corner kick, and we play the ball. And in the evaluation, I told them I want the ball more far post. So during the game, it was nil-nil at the moment, short corner kick, and we scored out of this set piece. We won this game 3-0 against Goat Eagles. Uh, we scored three corner kicks against them. This was a very um, important game for us. Uh, we were second, they were third. Um, in the first half, it didn't work our plan. So we um, said in halftime, okay, what we're gonna do, we're gonna still try to go uh, uh, look like we're trying to go short. So we draw a few players in, so they can't block our, us. We're gonna go a few near post, but we're gonna play the ball far post. And we scored a goal. And won the game one nil. So during the season, what I do as well is every round of the air Divisie and in the championship, the Keuken Kampioen Divisie, um, I look every goal back if they score from set piece and I put that in a database. Uh, so I can look back if we play against the opponent, how did they score the set pieces? So as well, I do data analysis of, op not of opponents, but of different clubs in different leagues. So uh, last year at the RKC, we had a data analyst and he can uh, see who can have has the most shots or headers on target or score the most goals out of set pieces. And I'm going to look into that 
uh, club, uh, how they set up their set pieces to, yeah, just to get new variations and see what other clubs do as well. So last Champions League, uh, Atletico Madrid uh, had 30.8% uh, out of um, set pieces. Uh, and you see it's getting lower uh, from 1819 was 18% and 1912. Uh, and in this percentages is no penalties uh, included. So the stats, and I put last Friday in as well, we scored 50 goals. We scored 18 set pieces this season is 36% was one penalty, which is not included in the rate. And uh, yeah, we scored 10 corner kicks this season. So something about my philosophy. So of course uh, you can uh, think of everything, but I think your club has to scout as well. So I think it's very important if you look at players and maybe you hesitate between two players that you can see, okay, are they good at set pieces? Do they have a good delivery? Can they have the ball? Uh, and sometimes I've got the feeling uh, this is not yet the case. So what I made is uh, for myself, all the variations I made in the past and what I will do in the future, uh, I created a playbook uh, like in American football. So something uh, I think is very important uh, to set up is your, for attacking is your delivery the hit zones and the timing of the runs. And another one, and I think, uh, yeah, that's a strength of the team I'm working now. Players reading the game and adaptability. So what is the opponent doing? And uh, if we've got two, three variations in the game, which one do we use and which will be the most effective? So I'll try to stop my screen now. Yeah. That was my presentation, Steve. All right, brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Serge. Yeah, we're sort of uh, looking forward to sort of dipping a little bit more into your your playbook, which is obviously uh, having a big impact with ten corner goals already this season. Yeah. Um. Finally, yeah, I'll sort of bring in then uh, Mads. Um. Obviously, I'll sort of share some of his approaches to coaching and, and a bit of use of, of technology when it comes to player technique. Um, so Mads, the, the screen is all yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. I just forgot one thing when, uh, when I was introduced. I met one guy who uh, changed me as a coach a lot and my way of thinking and that maybe he's here today. It's Nicolas Joba uh, being at City now. Uh, big thanks for that, mate. So uh, just to be sure that you will never be forgotten. If uh, you take a, this, uh, take a look at this and just put a set pieces and no brainer. I said it before. I don't understand why there's no, uh, you know, like why why there's such uh, few teams making a difference on the set pieces. Because I read somewhere seventy percent of all games when they are ended by the referee's whistle, they are ending with a, a goal difference from maximum one goal means you can have a huge impact on the result if you're good at set pieces. Then, of course, the number come up 30-35% of all goals are scored to, by set pieces. But in, in my world, it doesn't matter at all because you can have a team scoring a lot of goals. Uh, 20 games, they score, uh, say, 40 goals at all. And they, they score maybe eight set piece goals. In 20 games, that's fine, but in the, in the percentage afterwards, it's not that good. Or you can have the opposite. Um, you can have a team scoring in 20 games, they score uh, 10 goals, but eight of the goals, they are at such pieces as well. So it's the goal difference for me that it's important. Um, and then, of course, when you put up um, the set pieces, it's interesting to have a set piece league like you have a no normal uh, league schedule and, and all the results so that you can see which team is leading right now. Just an example. In the Premier League right now, um, you have West Ham with a goal difference of plus seven. In my book, they are leading. Then you have Leicester. They are third in the league. But at set pieces, they are very weak and they have minus eight in the goal difference. So imagine Leicester would have been better on the set pieces. Just going to zero 
maybe they would be second or first. The same if you take United. United in the gold difference um, on set pieces, they are minus two. But in the league, they are number one. So the big difference you see there is telling a lot about the strengths and the weaknesses of a team on set pieces, but also you know, like comparing to the league how it's going. And I use that a lot because it, it's telling you a lot about your opponents and where they can make better or where, where should be aware of, of, their, of their quality. And then, of course, also a no-brainer because uh, you said it before, the scouting of the clubs Imagine you have a central defender scoring six goals on corner kicks in a season. What will happen to his, uh, to his value? Of course, the club can sell him uh, for a lot of more money than if, if he doesn't score the goals. And if it's just a matter of having a set-piece coach or a goalkeeper coach or an assistant coach, which is very good at the set-pieces, to bring these qualities of a player into his team and into, into, into value, bring it, bring it into the team. That's a huge difference. So that's why I don't understand why there are not more you know, set-piece coaches or, or why there's not more, no more quality. But of course, there are also a lot of teams doing a lot and doing very good. We, we, it's not to, to forget that. Then general principles. I think it starts with the, it starts with the top of the club. It's a mindset starting at the, maybe at the board or the CEO, if they find it important to be good at set pieces and everybody can be sure they will do something about it. The head coach will, will be aware of it. Um, so that's where it all starts. How important is it for the club? Then minimize coincidences. Often when you, when you watch set pieces, I think maybe too often, it's a delivery. And then people or players are running in and hoping for the best. I would like to prepare success instead. Have a straight plan, prepare it. And the only, the only way you can do this is doing, you know, like having team discipline in the team. Because of course, there are different roles. The way I think I would rather have one player getting a totally free header, using four other players to make that happen. Then I would have a ball just in swing or out swing, and then we go for it one v one. Because I think it, at the end, it's a bigger chance to bring one player in balance on a good delivery on a free header than the other stuff. So, of course, you need to accept your role in the team. And that, of course, can be hard sometimes. That can be hard sometimes because some players I, I've met. Uh, you know, like very, very different players. Some players are thinking, okay, it's me. I'm a great header. It's me. I'm in focus now. Other players, I, I asked one player, he was playing, uh, he was coming back from France at a, at a great team, great player, fantastic player. And I asked him, you know, like his opinion, his ideas, and he just told me. And I was very surprised. He just told me, just tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. And I was like, fantastic. Fantastic. Because then you have, you know, like one of your soldiers you need on the pitch. Um, then, of course, one thing is building up great uh, set plays for a specific opponent. The other thing is developing players with technical skills that you can use in the games. And you need to be sure that you always have a stand-in. Uh, the way I, I prefer to do it was to take out three players and make uh, individual skill training. You can just see here. Uh, it's uh, in slow motion. It's a fantastic player. It's Erik Sviatchenko playing for uh, Michelin now, was in Celtic. And even if this header and the timing on this ball isn't perfect, it's great training. Because the relation will be trained, the timing, uh, he will get feedback on his header. Maybe a little bit early if you ask me. Um, and then you see the goalkeeper. It's, it's the third goalkeeper at that time. And it's just perfect. He's here because... For him, it's that important as, as well that the team's functions uh, are, are practiced in this way because one day he will stay there in the stadium. And if it's offensive or defensive wise, he's made to take responsibility. And he also needs to feel that he is a part of this. So it's maybe the best player and then the third goalkeeper uh, training together. And then, of course, you need to understand that it's a process. Um, 
and you need to make sure that you create a, a pipeline so you have players to step in. You sell a player, a new one is coming. Um, that was in the training pitch. On the other side, you will see it in the, in the game. It's exactly the same movements. We were behind in this game. Uh, we scored on this corner. Five minutes later, we scored on a corner more. And then we changed a player in that made the decision goal. and We won 3-2. And that was just fantastic. So, of course, it's a huge weapon. On this ball, there are a lot of players um, offering themselves by doing blocks just to create a situation for this player to be isolated uh, and on his own. And then you can talk about if it's a goalkeeper drop, whatever. That's not the point. The point is that you, you practice one we one in your, in your training here, in the skill training, and then you bring it to the 11 we 11 in the game. And that's clear, then he is also motivated to, to make extra training. Then another stuff is here, the direct free kicks. I cannot understand why on the direct free kicks um, there are not more goals. If you remember uh, Juninho or Asun Sao, just to, to name an example, or uh, Rigarino uh, Sini, uh, the Brazilian goalkeeper, then tell, tell me one, one player today where you just think if we get a free kick, then it's a goal. Um, and the way we practiced it at, at Midtjylland, we had the kicking coach, Bartek Silvestrak, a huge, a huge coach, what kicking striking is uh, about. He is fantastic. Um, very detailed, super, super guy. On the left side here, you have the pro. Uh, his kicking technique was more the spinner, side spinner, with a little bit of, uh, of top spin, but not that much, uh, but extremely uh, consistent and very good, has scored a lot of goals, uh, also direct free kicks. And then on the other side, you have, oh, sorry, you have the youth player making a top spinner. I'm sure that the top spinner is the future, even if it's not there in, in, yet uh, in that amount that I would hope. But I'm I'm pretty much sure it's gonna be it's gonna be crazy someday. Then we used a TrackMan system. TrackMan it's uh, the firm making the same stuff for the golfer, telling you everything about um, how the ball is acting after you strike. And I use that on the pitch to uh, give player feedback. Means that we, we try to see a direct free kick from 20 meters. We want to be as good at it is. Uh, we want to be as good at it as on a penalty. We want to make it being a penalty for us. During practice and feedback, for example, with the trackman system and the training with the tech. And what you see is, they build up a system where you can see the scoring opportunity window, which means if you look at the uh, average G factor, means how much the ball will, will go down. Then that is maybe for me, it's the key factor, because if you are very good at top spinner, then you will, you will put the ball over the wall and it will just dip down and it will be very hard for the goalkeeper to, to could take it because it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit more unpredictable than a side spinner. And of course the side spinner, you will also see in the scoring opportunity windows, if you compare the two windows, you will see on the left that the side spinner is not going that deep down. And also that's, that makes that the scoring opportunity is, is less. So that, that, that system we worked a lot with, and I'm, I'm also sure that it's going to be a part of the future. It also tells you something about the speed you're kicking with, because sometimes it's not necessary to kick very, very hard. Like, let's say 110 kilometers per hour, it's not, it's not necessary. It's maybe better to, to kick with 90 because then you make sure that the ball will fall down again. Um, and like I said before, I have just checked up uh, on Understat, understat.com. They, they make some statistics where I was looking for the Premier League and I was looking for direct free kick goals. 
And I found out there was eight direct free kick goals in the Premier League this season. And then I, I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I, I'm going to see it this way. You have 20 teams. They played at least 17, 17 games each team. Means you have seven times um, 20 teams playing an off offensive game. And that means that they were just scored um, one free, direct free kick goal after 42 games or 40, 42 and a half games. That's just crazy. But I also, I think I find out why. Uh, one of the things is that you, the players, they don't have that quality to bring the ball over the wall and make it dip down again. That's maybe the first point. Second point, maybe the players or the teams, they have the players in the squad, but they are not taking the free kick because they are not high enough in the hierarchy. And you can see it sometimes when you see a player from a great team going to the ball and he's just striking like, just imagine that, okay, I need to kick as hard as possible then it's going to going in. But what, what often happens is that it's just going 10 meters over the goal and, but nothing is, uh, nothing, uh, no one is, is telling him, ah, okay, maybe next time you should let the younger one take the kick if, if it's a, one, a younger one. So I think he's a, he's a very big window for, for getting better. Um, of course, Ward Prowse from, from Tarsam, he scored three of the goals. And you can imagine when you have five goals left for what did I say? 320 games. Yes, that was my input here. And I'm sorry for my English. It's not that easy to, to talk English. My, my second language is, is German. And then, yeah, but it's good train. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Matt. No, your, your third language is, uh, was perfect. I think that was pretty pretty clear and concise um, insights there on, on how you work and certainly interesting with, with the bring, introducing the trackman, which we'll certainly get to later in the, later in the discussion. Um, probably bring in Richard first then. Um, we'll sort of kick off on, on how we sort of how you each look at analyzing that first stage of analyzing set pieces. And, so Richard, when you, you begin your analysis process of looking at opposition set pieces, what are what are the key areas that you're you're looking at? Yeah, so I, I guess uh, first of all, like I kind of work, always work in a similar way to Surge, where I think it's so important to not just take a small sample. You need to take the full the full season. Um, you know, there's no point in making your pool of information smaller, you need to go full detail and, you know, and analyze every set piece that this team's taken. Um, in terms of like looking for opposition threats, the key things I normally look for are obviously the main areas to try and deliver the ball and then who are their main targets that they're trying to hit. Um, for the last two teams that I've worked for, we've obviously defended corner zonal marking, but that doesn't mean that then you can't necessarily put in one specific blocker to, you know, to block their key header or, or that type of thing. And then from, if we're looking at how we might be able to hurt a team, um, if I look at corners, for example, a big thing was that we always look for is how their setup changes when you put two players on, on the ball, you know, to take the corner. So who does that pull out? And then what extra space does that create? Um, so yeah, that's all, that was always a big thing that I, that I, was, that I will always look for is you know when we put two players on the ball how does that then affect the opposition setup and then also even if you you don't necessarily have to put the third player on the ball but as the ball maybe passes from the taker to the closest player and then the ball goes backwards again which of their players then has to go out to that third player because a lot of the time it might be a player who has to make up a big distance so that gives that third player more time to pick a pass or put in a delivery so it's all just about the key thing is basically identifying the space. Where is the space that is either going to A, hurt us, or B, that we can use to hurt them? Um, on that, yeah, I think that's the, the key point there, Serge, is identifying, identifying the space, but clearly doing it with a different way to what clubs probably did traditionally. I think traditionally, looking at opposition, was would just look at their previous three games. 
obviously the video allows you to sort of look in greater detail and like you say, create databases to, to study this? Uh, yeah, so the, the database I uh, built is then, yeah, when they concede goals. Um, so if I go, uh, and I always look at the, as well, yeah, I know who's doing the set pieces from the opponent. So is he still at the club? Do I know and think he's still there? So, uh, and if you can pick his brain a little bit and you can see, okay, the last time we, he, we played against each other, uh, what did we do? How did they react it? And then I look back, uh, yeah, also the last games, of course. Um, the way we set up, uh, I try to find uh, teams as well uh, who set up like us. For example, we do uh, as well sonar marking. So which teams are, are doing sonar marking? Uh, what do they do against sonar marking? Um, yeah, and try to sometimes they're triggers as well. So uh, they some teams do signals as well. What kind of signals do they do? And yeah, looking into all that kind of details. Um, yeah, to uh, how do you say that? Yeah, analyze them and yeah, try to predict what are they going to do uh, for the, for us to defend uh, well. Uh, yeah, what you see a lot is that they uh, we've got a really good header at the at the near post to uh, mark that zone. Uh, yeah, they try to uh, yeah get him away. So uh, make a make a decoy run at the near post. So how are we going to solve that? Uh, that's what happened this season uh, uh, for us. So you have to react and yeah, it's always evaluating uh, uh, yeah, your own set pieces to, to, to react. And it's easy when you've got players as well who, who get it and who understand it. And uh, like Matt said, you have to be aware as a player as well. Sometimes yeah, you're not the one who's going to score. Uh, and in the team I work with now, we've I've I've got think four players who can really score, and one is better at the near post, one is better at the far post. Um, so it changes every game where we got which zone we're gonna hit. Um, yeah, and they know okay, this game I'm probably not gonna score because it's not coming in my zone, but I know if uh, yeah. So we've got a, for example a centre back. He scored already five goals out of out of a set piece, so I I know he's highlighted from the, with the opponent in a certain space. So yeah, then we try to maybe hit different zones. And Mads, when you see you, you you sort of started going through that process of looking at an opposition and understanding where you can hurt them, and do you go with a really open mind of like you say finding the spaces and then coming up with ideas of how you can exploit that or do you always have something in mind when you begin first, that process first of all i need to say sorry for for search uh, search the player the central defender i think you're gonna sell him so you need to find a new one <laughs> well, i didn't no, miss no. The name, so you have to do some uh, some work so. <laughs> okay and then to answer your question steve I think the most important part of um, what I like so much at set pieces is it's mind games. I, I still remember, you know, like when we are best, when we, we were at our best, then you, you could see the, the opponent, the, the next coming opponent in the stadium to try to read our signals because it's not the camera finding everything. And then you can just feel that they are looking so hard on what's going to happen now, what's going to happen against us. And then it's like like uh, Richard and, and Serge, they, they said, then you start creating set plays for the next game. But you also know what, what have you done in the last game and the game before that, and you can be sure they're going to see it. So that's why variation is the key. You need to, you need to surprise your opponent. You, sometimes you need to do something totally different just on the first or second, second corner kick to make them thinking, oh, shit. We are not prepared for this because then you get a better opportunity to, to hurt them. But if you're giving them what they expect, then I think it's not, not easy to defend, but then it's easier to defend. But it's also like you see something and you try to, to plan two weeks forward. And I told you in, in, in one of our conversations that 
of course you can wake up in the night because you've got an idea it happens it happens that you you you're not sleeping that that deep that you're still thinking of what's what's going to happen next time or how we're going to fix this and then you got an idea you wake up and then maybe the idea is good or maybe it's like shit but it's just all the all the thoughts you have in your head about the set pieces i just i, I love it it's it's uh, it's giving so much energy and then of course you need to uh, you need to bring in the players i think that at fc midland the players were fantastic they were coming in hey my friend has scored this goal for for a russian team can you look at it i looked at it and then i said oh that's fantastic we're gonna we're gonna steal this because that's also part of the game of course we're gonna steal this but we're gonna try to make it a little bit better and make it fix in to our system and our players like richard said before the detail is the key and there are so many details so you cannot just watch a set play and copy it you need to understand it i think as well Matt. sorry just to hope you don't mind That's me okay. there, but there was a something that you said that i just think was was so true about that mind games factor if i think back to um and you probably looked at them a lot um so stoke city and when they was in the premier league under tony pulis and it was i remember teams would go away to stoke and they would put the ball out for a corner instead of a throw in because they were so worried about the long throw and you could see that when teams were defending in those areas near their goal they were so worried about giving away a throw in or you know it just it was blowing their minds they it the mind stoke had won the mind games before the game had kicked off because the opposition knew that they had this long throw when it was so dangerous and it was all in the media in england and the, then then obviously their their prophecy of being this set piece team just grew organically because everywhere you turned, everyone was telling everyone how good Stoke were at set pieces and how dangerous the long throw was. I think it's such a good point. I was going to bring back in Maz. There was um, another thing you brought up there in your process that you're wake, waking up in the in the middle of the night for these plans. So I just wondered how much time you were giving yourself in preparing for games. Um, and probably we'll get to this with. Riches and surge, particularly in the middle of a season, seems maybe you're going week to week when you're looking at the next opposition. But do you give yourself a little bit more time than that to allow those ideas to percolate and to the point where you're sort of dreaming about them? I always try to. It, it of course depends on how many days you have between the games and how much training time you have on the pitch and how much time you have for making presentations. So it's all like it's one big bunch you need to to figure out but I, i just like to be like two weeks uh, forward the the game plan because then you can be more strategic uh, you can you can plan what your next opponent opponent should see so maybe you have a game where you are the favorite and you know okay nine out of ten games we're gonna win this without set pieces then maybe you can hide a little bit of your stuff for the game after if it's like I think it was search you you were meeting number two or number three um, in a very important game. Then you can maybe bring it in there instead. It can also be that you have a fun, fundament that you want that you would like to hide a little bit. So you bring in a new system and and play that system for three games, and then you come to back to the old again. But then the old is new. And then I know, of course, the the other coaches they also look a lot of games backwards. But I think that many coaches they they look at the last three games, and then they build their opinion on the last three games, and try to make a prediction out of that. Because it's also limited what you can get into the players. You cannot say to the players, in the last three games they did like this and this and this. So be aware of this tomorrow. And then afterwards you say, but game number four, five, and six they did like this, because then you already you know like, then the value of your input. It's already already falling a little bit a little bit apart, but of course you need to make the players understand that they should adapt to what's happening. And, uh... yeah. Well, Matt, sorry to to break in. Yeah, so what you said about that game, so that was an important game for us against the, the Gaaschap. Uh, we were second, they were third, um, and I knew because we went uh, the games before a lot of uh, corner kicks ended up near post so yeah we we knew uh and that maybe we had a chance f more in the f at the far post in in that zone uh and that's why we tried to set up 
for a short corner kick, draw as many players out. So that would be more, we could get more space in the back. Exactly. That's fantastic, I think. Yeah. So also the joy, the joy you get filled with, of course, because that's why you're doing it, I think. It's the joy you get out of it. Yeah, and, and it, it gets, uh, how do you say, I don't know how to say it in English, I have to think. Uh, but it really works for the players as well, because they go like, hey, search, it worked, well done. Yes. And yeah, so because, and then it's easier to train again, the set pieces and the presentations is better. And for example, I have a WhatsApp group uh, with certain players who are key in the set pieces. And I go to them like, okay, if you see, if you're watching television and you see a nice set piece or a nice variation, just put the game uh, in the WhatsApp group and and I'm, I'm gonna uh, yeah look for it and sometimes uh, I put uh, variations in the in the whatsapp group and I'm like okay what do you think do you do you think this will work for us can we do it and then they go yes or no or maybe we can change and they really start to think about the set pieces as well what will help in in the game as well to adapt to it I think that's so powerful what you, you both just mentioned it there that actually you're starting to change the culture of your players and team around set pieces i know that in the past traditionally maybe it was something that you know was maybe kind of dismayed a little bit oh it's not it's not a nice way to score goals and things like that but what is so powerful there is and you see it you know when you see teams when they've worked on a set piece and they score from it often they'll run straight to the bench and they want to go and celebrate with you know with the likes of serge who's thought it up and things like that and I think once you've got that buy-in of the players, as you've both said, that the sky's the limit in terms of what you can achieve. You've changed the culture and mindset of, of the team and it's becoming as important as what are the movements on our goal kick and you know everything else. It's exactly the same value and I think that's a really strong place to be in. Yeah, nowadays it's more like everybody talks about it. It's more, it's like, it's almost like it's trending, you know? And uh, I know the time that yeah, I, I worked at Dutch national team under 15. And of course, they are younger boys, but they didn't take it that serious, you know? And then it's like, oh, we have to train set pieces. Oh, uh, we have to practice it. Uh, and then they have to, and then you're more focusing on, hey, come on, boys, this is very important. You know, this is, we can score from this. And, and, and they don't realize yet uh, how important it can be. It, it, you, can, you can win uh, Champions League because of that, because of a set piece, you can go to the next round because of a set piece. But yeah, sometimes uh, yeah, you need to change the culture. And of course, if you have results, it, it helps you and it becomes easier. Yeah, that uh, was a big thing I was going to bring up with you, Matt. Um, so thanks for sharing that. I just wondered, yeah, so like you say, when you're bringing that culture, obviously having things like the WhatsApp group, but but yeah, how do you go about sort of in, encouraging that? Obviously, it helps if you have on the match day that you're scoring from these set pieces to get that buy-in, but sort of when you're beginning that process, how do you sort of encourage the players to get on board and that you're also sucking the information out from them? Because obviously they're playing against teams. How valuable is also using their sort of analysis as well as what you're seeing on video? Yeah, I think the first of all, like I said in the beginning, it needs to come from the top that this is important for the club. It also needs to be important for the kit manager or the physiotherapist or whoever because everybody can come with, come with feedback to it and everybody can help making this culture growing. Then, of course, I think the, the, the most important part of it is the relationship to another human being. In this, kind, uh, you know, in, this, in this case, it's the player to make sure that the player understands the value, not only for the team or for the club, but also for the player himself or herself. Because at that point where you have the center back scoring five, six goals, then they're going to take the next step. That's for sure. They're going to take the next step next league higher level um, they're gonna they're gonna become champions they're gonna they're gonna be a national team player but it's also an opportunity to you know, like if you're very good at direct free kicks for example sometimes i'm a little bit crazy here i predict that in five years if you have a player on the on the bench who is uh, outstanding at the top spin free kick 
Then after 60 minutes, the head coaches will tell him to warm up. And if you get a direct free kick, 22 meters, 20 minutes before the game is over, then they're going to call that player and put him in to take that kick. Just an example. We had a, um, there's a young player at FC Michelin. He's called uh, Victor Torp. He's a central midfielder, great player. His free kick is totally crazy. It's insane. And his consistency in it. He, uh, at one training, he was coming up to the first team. And then we all, as, you know, sometimes after training, we put up a, a wall and then we put a goalkeeper on the goal and then we let them shoot. Also to find out who should shoot in the match. At FC Milan, it was always Jakob Poulsen, great kicker, great hit, perfect. But this young guy was coming up and uh, smelling the first team football. He took 10 direct free kicks in the training, after the training. People were looking. He put nine of them in. He put nine of them in. That, that's not just a technical ability. It's also mental mindset that he can do it. So in case I had him on the bench, I would put him in because I, I knew this is a very, very big chance. And I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to say it again. That's going to be the future. That's going to be you know, like your joker. Put him in. He's going to take this direct free kick. So watch out for it. Yeah, see, so maybe it'll be a time, it'll be a, a rule change where it becomes a bit like hockey. And you can bring in the, the specialists that they're having hockey with short corners. Um, there's one, one thing I wanted to bring up with Richard, which you, you mentioned with, the, with the, how much analysis goes into the set plays and, and the signals that teams are, are doing. Do you, as an analyst, do you, do you put a lot of time into trying to dissect that? Or do you find that clubs don't, do it as much as, as as what some may think or there are certain clubs that clearly do there's a lot of teams that do use signals without a shadow of a doubt um but from my point of view as an analyst sometimes it's very clear what their signal means other times you could drive yourself insane trying to work out what their signal means because they could seemingly be doing the same signal and then they do a completely different type of delivery or they have different numbers in the box so i guess in a way it almost shows sometimes it can be really really powerful so I know that um, there used to be one that uh, Sarri would do at Chelsea with their throw-ins where um, if the player held the ball behind his back um, it was normally like when it was close to the opposition goal the uh, the taker would hold the ball behind his back with two hands and then that would signify like that two of their players would do a crossover movement and they'd always throw it to the one closest to the opposition goal or you know it was something something like that anyway so that was um, a signal that I'd clearly identified and I'd, I'd seen it take place what 20 or 30 times from the games that I'd analysed. So I was quite confident that that signal signified that movement. Whereas there was been other teams that I've watched where they're raising one hand and every single time the ball was getting delivered to a different area, they've got different amounts of players in the pitch. It's a different type of delivery. So in those instances, I would just not get myself wrapped up in that because I think then almost um, like Mad says before, you kind of, you're getting yourself into a mind game of trying to work out well, what, what does it mean? You drive yourself mad with it when actually, if it's not that clear to you, then maybe it's not that clear information to give to the players because you're not sure of it. Yeah, and Serge, I mean, in terms of your analysis, so we'll put it on an analysis angle here rather than uh, maybe what the, the stats issuers decide. Um, there's a question from Stefan Weiss. Um, so could you define what a, a set piece goal is? As in, after the execution, is there something like a timeline that you have to score within 10 seconds to count as a set-piece goal? How do you evaluate that? Where do you still keep it as a set-piece goal, Serge, in your database? And when do you decide, all right, does a second, third phase goal from a set-piece, does that get filed elsewhere? Yeah, for... for uh... For myself, in my da database, I uh, what I do is like, okay, um, if uh, somebody has the ball away and they uh, shoot the ball from, uh, let's say, outside the box, it still counts as a set piece goal because yeah, they set up the player um, at the edge of the box for uh, the second ball who will drop there. So uh, that's included. But if it's like uh, the ball goes away, uh, is uh, received by the one on the box, goes back to the side, 
and then brought in again and it's not in the routine then i don't count it as a, a, a set piece goal and i know uh, some of those like you've got instead and y scout i think they uh, say it's like okay within three passes is within three passes they score um yeah then it counts as a set piece goal and i think if you if you compare it if i compare it in my da database and where i uh, use it for it has to be in the routine so if it's still in the routine uh i put it in my da database because then we can uh, react on it I think that's a really good question as well, by the way, because I, I don't personally, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to it. I think as long as you stick to your principles, whether that be coming from above or if you're the, the key stakeholder in terms of the person responsible, as long as you code them in the same way, then I think that's absolutely fine. But I've, I've had this conversation with a few coaches in the past and it's so interesting. Do you base it on the positions of the attacking players? So, you know, if the centre back's still up there, for example, even if, even if that's after six passes then would he be up there normally I don't know um, is it based on when the opposition get back into their shape so if the number nine comes back to defend the free kick for example is it until he's back you know back up the pitch higher up the pitch it's there's absolutely no right or wrong answer in my opinion but I think the key is consistency as long as you're coding everybody's set pieces in the same way whatever you define that's the important way to get you know consistent information out of it yeah, it's also where do you, for, so for my database, where do I use it for? Yeah, I use it for uh, the routine they do uh, to analyze that. I want to uh, yeah, sh show show it in the presentation of the opponent, like, okay, this is how they score. This is how they they may be set up. And this is these are the threats. So if I look up in a, a team in my database, I can see it. I can do it in, on an individual base. Um, yeah, so for me, that's important to know the routine. Okay, fantastic. Um, I suppose the only other aspect of that then is, obviously, if you have your own very clear, defined definitions there, but obviously there's little conflicts with other stats providers, how then when you're marrying that up and if other people in the club are looking at that you've set things up, one way and they'll be looking at details on on games from say like you say in stat where it's it's different how does that cause a problem how do you get that to align uh, no it, yeah it doesn't cause a problem because yeah um yeah we know we are good at set pieces so everybody understands the importance of the set pieces um uh at my club yeah they they like the numbers as well um so my the rate that i showed uh is 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 lower uh than it could be because i think we uh scored three or four goals out of the the second and third phase of corner kick um and and i think the rate is still good um but yeah more important it's about yeah uh, winning the games and the set pieces helps us a lot on it so um yeah it's it's, it's not a, a discussion i've got i get enough time uh the manager emphasis also on on set pieces so yeah it's it's nice to work yeah brilliant brilliant i think we'll kind of move the conversation then on now on to the the sort of the coaching aspect and and mads when you sort of having these ideas of how you're going to set up at set pieces i suppose everything has to begin in pre-season that's where the majority of your work goes it's where you have more time to really set the sort of the fundamentals of what you're going to do as a, an attacking and a defending team at set pieces yes of course but i also need to say that it, it changes so it means like of course you have a lot of time in pre-season you build a fundament but good teams, they adapt to your, your, your playing style on, on the set pieces and then you need to recreate. And you also need to find out, you know, sometimes the, the players you have on the pitch and the style of play in the club can change a little bit. It means you need to adapt to that as well. So for me, it's more an ongoing process um, to make sure that you get the best out of your own team, but you still remember what have you shown in the past? You, you, you know what I mean? 
So for me, it's not like I cannot build it in the preseason and then that's it. I can build something in the preseason, uh, but in the preseason, maybe more important, I can build relations the, between the players and between areas I want to attack so that the time is, is, is going to be practiced a lot. And then after that, it's just a matter of how I want to set it up for the games in like game number 15 or 16 or 17. Then I know the fundament in the, in the relationship between two players is there. Uh, I, need, uh, I know he has practiced this area. Uh, and then the only thing that can vary it is maybe his starting points as a position to start. So for me, it's more you know, like the, the playbook itself, it's like, it's like changing all the time and going in different directions. It can also be that you have had, uh, like, uh, in the one season we scored after every 12th um, corner kick, for example. But there was also a period where we didn't score after 30. And then it was like not satisfying. And because of that, we needed to change to give a new inspiration to the players. Doesn't mean that the, that the, that the setup was not good enough, or, but maybe they just need new input. They need a new task to get uh, even sharper. That we should not forget that players they also need to you know, like stay hungry and stay interested. And when you have done something twenty times, then you know sometimes it's like oh, I'm gonna do it again. But then someday you get a new task, and then you 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 need to know that. We count on you now, and this is different, and you need to be aware now and look after this so that you you know, like you still remember that it's not a machine, it's a it's a person. And you need to find the trigger for that person. You think, so? you think it's possible to get um the same level of success that you've had if you haven't got the buy-in from the players? Sorry, yeah, I didn't hear it. Um you know how you were just saying about obviously you need to maybe change things and adapt things to keep things fresh sometimes and, you know, keep the buy-in from the players. Do you think without the buy-in from the players, it's impossible to have success from set pieces? Yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think that you can have success without having the players on your side. It's, for me, it's not possible. Of course, you can have, you can have the, then you can have this, you, you put it in, in swing, and then a goalie makes it a, you know, a mistake. But in the end, it's all about relationship to the players. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, completely agree. But it's also, you know, like you can also have players that are so selfish that they are hard to reach or that they, you know, like instead of letting the one guy taking the header, then they go by themselves because they want to score. And that's only... There, are, of course, there are more ways to, to handle that, but I think maybe the best way to handle a situation like this is to show it in the presentation in front of the team because nothing is stronger than the team and the hierarchy in the team, of course, but because if, if somebody sees, okay, you're not going in that direction as, um, as us, you don't want us, then forget it. And maybe team is the keyword because that's, that's the part of the, the word that I love so much. Together, everyone achieves more. That also means that if you put every puzzle together, then it would just be normal. But if you then get like 30% more, then everybody understands it when they see it. When Serge, in your, your presentation, you kind of set out quite clearly how, how you sort of look to work from pre-season through to the season. But just, yeah, I wonder then those details in the in the summer, in the preseason, what are what are the fundamentals that you're working on there in terms of one understanding the players that you're working with, getting that buy-in and yeah, I I talk to the players and um, ask them okay uh, maybe they're new at the club or they they already played at the club so that's a difference as well. So if they're new at the club, uh, ask them okay what are you used to. Um, uh, how did you set up defensively last season? Uh, did, did you did you like it, uh, uh, or what do you think uh, can be better in that way? And 
yeah, try to have a conversation like that also on an individual level. Okay, uh, I ask them, what do you think your job uh, can be uh, in, in attacking, in, in defense? Um, and what I do is, yeah, have a session like that as well with the, with the team. Okay, um, for example, now I had the, the, the presentation of last year, the sheets um, I got and I uh, put them on and I said, okay, this is how you set up uh, a last year. Um, uh, what did you like? What you, did you dislike? Um, how can we do better this season? Do you, they did sonar marking? Uh, do you think uh, it's effective that you didn't? So they concede, I think, three or four goals out of a corner kick. Uh, why was that? And then I had a footage there as well, what they can do better. Uh, and I had some changes, how, how we can improve uh, and maybe not concede those goals. Um, and then attacking wise, um, yeah, ask them for variations as well. And in my playbook, um, I've got uh, from uh, how I set it up is like, okay, I've got a set piece, uh, let's say set piece number one. And uh, this is how we, uh, these are the, are the positioning. This is the timing of runs. This is the area we're going to hit. Uh, and I've got a, f a few basic uh, uh, corner kicks and, uh, that's what we're going to train in preseason. Pre and from that point, uh, see what they like and which are successful. And from there, I had a variation. So I've got, for example, uh, number one A, number one B, number one C. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, how I try to work uh, and, yeah, get, get the team there as well. And uh, I tell them as well, it's not set in stone everything so sometimes you you have to adapt or uh, uh, if i've got two players who are really good at the far post uh, sh switch sometimes so in the game uh, yeah the opponent does, oh yeah he always goes far post or he always goes so yeah then it's it's a it's a decoy run uh, because yeah th then a, a different player is going and you yeah, that's in the in the mindset, and yeah, try to um, how would you say it? Yeah, drive the the opponent a little bit crazy that they don't know what to do and uh, what we're doing. And I think that's a key as well. Yeah, if you're not surprising and always do the same, yeah, they can set up uh, a, a, a something that, that you can't score anymore. So yeah, you need to adapt during the season. Um, and I think if those basic set pieces you've got. Uh, if they're very clear and, and they know how to do it, then, um, yeah, it's easy to make a variation on that as well. And, yeah, during the season, uh, I don't do five or six different variations in a game, but I look and we can, and I pick the set pieces, maybe two or maybe three, that they can change. And uh, always I have got one they know it, it was successful the last time um, or we are good at and yeah I, I feel players want that that okay it's not going uh, like we want to we go back to that one corner kick we were very successful and give that a try. Um, so the open question here then from from Matt Doyle um, is asking when designating roles for defending set plays what is a bigger consideration in your opinion that either one but they're set up so that on the transition the players come out in their shape positions more easily and therefore have a better structure afterwards or just putting the best people in the best positions regardless of their position and transition afterwards uh, for me, it's the last one. So it's about defensively, it's about not conceding a goal. And yeah, of course, if, if there are similar types in certain areas, yeah, you can change them that they are, that we're back in shape uh, as quick as possible. But for me, it's like not conceding a goal is the most important thing. Yeah, I would agree with um, I'd agree with you there, Serge, completely as well. I think if you start thinking to basically, I think if you're going in with the mindset of you're already thinking about how can we attack, 
then you're not dealing with the task at hand to start with. And it's probably likely that if you're thinking in that way, that you're probably going to concede more goals from the set piece just because you're not paying it its full attention. I would completely agree. Put your, you know, if your number nine is the best header um, and you know you have somebody in your front post zone, that's obviously a key zone and you can, you can head away a lot of corners from that position. I would put the number nine in that zone and then obviously you focus on getting up the pitch again once you've defended through the phases. So Mads, uh, take you back to uh, to one of these uh, dreams you've had about a set piece. You've woken up in the middle of the night and you've had this clear vision of a, of a set piece that can work. I just wonder what is the process then after that? How do you translate that dream to the players so that they can perform it on a on a match day? I mean, how does that work on the on the pitch? Are you using sort of visuals to help get that message across? How how does that all work? Well, you, you can do many things when you have an idea. Um, mostly, you just need to write it down in a hurry. Otherwise, you will forget it again. That's the first piece of it. Then the next piece of it. You need to, you need to find, you know, like you said it before, Serge, you have this group of players, you know, like with interactions in, in the WhatsApp group, the, the key players. You need to have them on on your ideas and the way you can do it you can do um one one we one evaluation that could be on the set piece taker or the header look at this um, look at your timing um, then you can bring out an an ipad on the on the training pitch i, I did that a lot ipad big ipad filming uh, like you saw the clip from the training before and giving straight feedback in the session after maybe you know like not every header or every kick but every third or every fourth so that so that you can um, so that you can give more than just standing there and say good or not good um, but there are a lot of tools the presentation is of course i think the presentation in front of everybody is the key and then i think that your small the, the small work you know the small relationship work in in the one we one or one to two or you pick out your three best headers and say look at this set play what do you think uh, how can we build this for you so that one of you is coming free here and then they will start discussion uh, a little bit and then they will um, find an agreement and then we go out and practice it that, that you know that that's the way to do it i think you always need to um, to do it through the relation sometimes you can also be very straight up uh, one example i had a player i said on the expected goals, you should have scored 4.2 goals. You have scored two. That's not good enough. What do you think? And then I said, and expected goals is also, you know, like the value of expected goals, the way I understand it is there's taking a lot of data and putting into an average. And let's say the average player is me. And then the other player I took the conversation with, I thought, and I think that he's a way better hitter than the average. So maybe these expected goals should be higher for him. So then it's the question, why I'm not hitting it every time? Why I'm not there? And then you can go back and, and, and ask about the mental mindset sometimes of players. If you have a penalty kick, what is your, what is your focus? What is your focus when you're standing there and you know the, the corner kick is coming at the second post and you're going to hit it? Is there a difference? Yes or no? And if there is a difference, then it's not good enough. It can also be that you have a player who has just been um, physically uh, involved in some kind of battle, you know, and the pulse is just, and he is out of his mind and he's very angry and, and then he goes for the corner kick. But you demand, of course, that he stay focused when he goes to the corner kick. But often, of course, it's also about feelings. And if you're not in control of your feelings, then you cannot deliver a perfect timing and a perfect technical um, header, for example. So there, there, are, there are so many small pieces you need to put together. And of course, it's individual and the feedback should be individual because that can be the issue for the one player. And then you can have another player who is, oh, no, 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 no. They put it up on the first post and it's me. You know, when you look at him outside, he can be strong and, and you are sure he, he's going to make it. But if inside his, his, his thought is that he's not 
he's not ready and he's thinking too much about or oh, if i miss it what then will they laugh at me or, or what could it be and that you need to find out as a as a coach a great coach he will find out uh, stuff like that and he will know how to influence the the different players and i have learned a lot after being two and a half years in the first team so uh, of course you learn every 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 day but i learned a lot here which i will bring into the next of course i was going to just ask you that sorry i, I, I didn't mean to interrupt uh, interrupt you there Matt. i was just going to ask you about, um how important is it you know when you're when you're actually on the pitch and coaching the set pieces that it's done under the right environment i know that I don't know, maybe um, you might have a day when a player's uh, delivering and, it, and they're doing it and they're not really fatigued and they've got a clear mind and things like that. But how important is it to, like you say, in a game, it might be the 88th minute, he might have just ran 40 metres to try and get into the box on a header. How is there anything you do to sort of mentally to help a player just reset before he takes that delivery? It's like with a penalty kick. <clears throat> a penalty kick is a zero point... Uh, seven six uh, percentage who score and if you are stressed to a penalty kick you know like you're gonna miss and i think that there was a, um, a study which said that if you take your run up you know the, the the referee is whistling and then you take your run up very fast after that then you're under stress and then the chance to miss is higher yeah. so the, the one free kick taker we had uh, was very great is Jakob Poulsen. Maybe you know him. He's a fantastic player and such a good foot. Really. Yeah. Um, I, didn't, I didn't need to tell him that much because he had so much experience. But for the, young, but for the younger ones in the pipeline, of course, we, we practiced it. Uh, one time, I also remember we practicing, you know, to run, like shuttle run. Yes. Put the ball, deliver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to try to put the same amount of pressure or breathe, you know, like breathe problems into it. But of course, you know, like you get a corner kick, you relax, you make sure everything's fit in. Take a deep breath. And then instead of focusing on any, anything, you know, like just remember what to do. Because you can be nervous. And, and of course, it, like you said, 88 minutes played, it's Champions League final. You, you cannot tell me that then you're not a little bit nervous, just a little bit. <laughs> of course you're a little bit nervous. Or you're taking an important penalty. Of course you're a little bit nervous. But what to do, the most important to do in this case is to try to get it out of your head and focusing on the technique. And that's, that's what, what I've practiced a lot. This technique, technique, technique. doesn't matter if you're here or on Bernabeu or, uh, you know, like, it doesn't matter. And as well, in such you know, in football, such an open game, generally, it's actually one part of it that is, especially the art of the actual delivery. It's quite a close skill, isn't it? You you know, especially from a corner, you're delivering from the same point on the field always. Okay, maybe you might have a little bit less space on a run up because of the the surroundings of the pitch or whatever. But it's quite a closed skill in the grand scheme of things, isn't it? Yes, yes, I, I think absolutely. The corner kick is for me. Maybe you know, like I said it before. Um, in the future, the direct free kick from 22 meter, it's going to be a goal for sure. After that, the corner kick, because you always have the same distance. And you know, the corner kick, you can practice. And, you, and I also know a lot of people are saying you cannot, you cannot build your own delivery guy. Of course you can. Of course you can. It's a fixed, it's a fixed mindset if you said it's not possible. You can take a guy from the under 19, practice with him twice a week, and then you can make him ready for the first team someday. It's that, that should not be the problem. If you cannot do it, then you know, like I sometimes say, then you're not good enough because, of course, it's possible. And it's a huge a corner kick. Serge, you said it before 10 goals on the corner kick uh, right now. And then if you take the second phase, you, are, you maybe have 14 goals. It's a huge impact on, 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 on the team, it's a huge impact to the points. So yeah, so, such a quality with these numbers. Yeah, it is. It is. It is, and and they have the conf They get the confidence as well. That and you see the it works for the opponent now as well. So if we have a corner kick, you see the, the opponent. You see a little bit the, the the panic from oh there there it comes. We have to be, we have to be sharp because they're very good. Yes. So, uh, 
I, 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 would, I would try to say, I feel that you're nearly disappointed when you get a corner kick and you didn't score. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was funny because last Friday uh, we, we played against a club who was at the bottom of the league. And um, our, our striker, who, who, who's got a big impact as well, he, he, he got subbed because, yeah, he, he couldn't play for 90 minutes. Uh, he came out, the first thing he said to me, he said, how the beep is possible that we didn't score from a corner kick. And then uh, a corner kick later, because it was 1-0 when he came out, we scored 2-0. Uh, so I said, oh, uh, you see, that's why, because you didn't make a good run. And now I've got the proper player. So, so he had a laugh then. But uh, yeah, so you, it, it really uh, is, is, how do you feel? The players feel it as well. It, it's like, sometimes it's a disappointment. Yes. Uh, and it's even after a game that players come to me and said, oh, Serge, we, we didn't score from a, from a set piece. Uh, yeah, next, next time... Next game, I'm gonna score one for you. So that don't you don't have to score it for me. It's for the team. So yes. yeah, it's I think it's really good. There's a question here from Alexander Pearson. It says, uh, "Hey guys, I remember reading that in preparation for the 2018 World Cup, Gareth Southgate used ideas from the NBA for England set pieces in which they scored a few goals." Uh, obviously, with there's basketball, and are there any other sports that you borrow ideas from? Clearly, that sort of likeness there with basketball is the idea of blocking or is it screening. I think they call it in basketball. I know that uh, Nicholas from uh, City he used uh, basketball a lot and showed me some clips uh, at some point. Um, here in Denmark, we play a lot of handball, and of course, I have a lot of friends which are handball coaches and. They, they have great inputs also in terms of uh, blocking, but also surprise plays. You know, just an example. You can discuss the, um, the Kemper trick where you throw the ball in and totally surprising after you can put it in. I think that when you take a look at the, the free kicks, when they have a central free kick and put it to the side to hit it back to one across instead of going for the goal, that reminds me a little bit of the Kemper trick from handball. I don't know if you you know it, but that's that's where I found some inspiration as well. And likewise, Serge, um, and obviously, uh, obviously looking there at those trick plays, uh, there's a sort of question that follows up with that from Stefan Weiss that, uh, yeah, how important are those kind of fake surprise set pieces? Um, he, he uses the example of the Liverpool goal against Barcelona in the Champions League semi-final when... Uh, um, Trent Alexander Arnold sort of uh, yeah caught the Barcelona's defense sleeping and, and found Divock Origi. Um, yeah, in general, yeah, that... I, I I think it's uh, it's good to to have them because yeah it it's it's different than your routine. So if they uh, yeah see your routine and uh, yeah it's it's easier to to mark and it's easier to defend. And if you've got several options, yeah, they, they're gonna hesitate and, and you've got more chance to score. So you have to, uh, yeah, how, how do you get the biggest chance to score? So if you saw uh, the goal we scored in the 89 minute against the Graafschap, uh, you saw that there were uh, three players close to the ball. So we had to draw them out. Uh, we played it far post, but there was also another player at the edge of the box uh, so who can, yeah, where we can play it to and he can shoot the ball uh, at once. Uh, so, yeah, I think those kind of trick plays, uh, yeah, can be very important to break the routine and, uh, yeah, mess up the minds of the opponent a little bit. I think with that yeah. goal against uh, Barca as well, for example, I mean, obviously I, I've never worked for Liverpool, so I don't know if it was the case, but I'd be very surprised if that was something that they'd worked on. I think it was like Serge had mentioned before and, and Mads as well, that it almost that sometimes you've just got to have a bit of a intuition as a player. And, you know, you see things, you try things and that, and that that should be applauded because like, you know, like we're saying, if everything becomes a routine and set, it's all too robotic and, and that isn't how football works because you're interacting with people and there's emotions involved and there's all these different things. So in certain aspects, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic to, you know, 
to be able to give set and structure and routine. But in other points like that, moments like that, are, you know, why these players are at the top of their game because they're able to smell things almost, you know, just having that bit of intuition to, to see a moment or make a decision in the heat of the moment. Yeah, I think in that game, I think it was a hats off to the analysis team at Liverpool. I think they uh, had highlighted that the Barcelona players, they switch off. They are looking around. They don't, they don't when conceding a set piece, that they're all straight into their roles, that they do tend to sort of slowly get into position. And so, yeah, I think that the players were aware of it then. But like I say, always it comes down to the execution and the buy-in. If Alexander-Arnold and Origi hadn't bought into what the analysis had told them, you know, that, that, goal, doesn't, that goal doesn't happen. Um, Analysis-wise, there's a question then here for you, Richard. Um, Zubin Jahavi says that City seem to score a lot of goals from kickoffs. But how important was the focus on kickoffs as an important set piece as a restart? And then how was that? Maybe then if the coaches can then also come in and sort of is that something that you kind of work on a lot with your clubs? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, to be honest, in the time I was at City, I don't recall us ever specifically working on our own kickoffs. It just more came out as part of our sort of structure in open play anyway. That obviously, it's not like we were just setting the ball backwards and playing a long ball. You know, we were getting into our into our patterns straight away. So I guess indirectly, we were working on them, but as part of a wider kind of team structure, as opposed to being, look, we're going to set up 10 kickoffs and, and work that way. But we did do it from the opposition point of view so you know we'd always look at how the opposition um, would kick off and that would be the beginning of every meeting we did on the opposition would always start off with how they kick off because it's obviously the first part of, of their play um, and you know with certain teams if they may be overloaded one side and, and have four players on that side then you know we'd, we'd replicate that in training and, and work on it because it was something that was going to happen. Serge and Mads, I mean, it's a kickoffs um, as part of the restart. So, they something that you personally are, are involved with? Yeah, I'm involved with that as well. And it's, yeah, now it's different, of course, because uh, I know in Holland, yeah, a lot of clubs use it as well to, to get uh, the crowd going a little bit as well. Uh, so, try to be, uh, straight away build a little bit of momentum. Um, and, uh, so, yeah, what they do is, like uh, Richard said, try to overload one side and then get the ball there, keep them on their own off, press them, and then you get a crowd. <laughs> of course, now it doesn't don't, don't work like that. Um, actually, uh, last week I saw a nice one from uh, a cup game. Uh, it's Hercules Omelo against Feyenoord. Um, they, they mixed it up uh, a little bit and they went straight to goal. And it was, yeah, they, um, they had a chance, but they didn't score. Um, so yeah, there's something I think uh, I can still uh, look more into it. Um, but yes, sometimes uh, yeah, I don't have the time for it as well. So yeah, it's something to look at as well. I'm sort of moving on then. Finally, then with the, the technical technology side of, of things, obviously we sort of touched in with it. Sort of simple things. We're just having the WhatsApp groups and how you, you do your presentations. But I'm sure. Everyone was kind of interested, Mads, uh, you're using the, the ball tracking in terms of working with players on their technique. Um, just, yeah, I wonder if you'd sort of share a little bit more on, on how that works and, and the sort of reaction you get from the players to that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it started all with the, with the kicking coach, Bartek, coming in. And then Trackman was like making this new device, which could tell you everything about the kick. And, um, you know, like, it's a radar you put behind the goal and then you put your iPhone behind the player so that you will film it live. And then you have this iPad in the hand so that, you know, like, the, the player takes his run up, he strikes the ball, and then, you, you, you know, like, you get everything. You get the speed, you get the spin, um, the spin rate, um, the, the G factor, how much it will gonna be, be put, uh, put down. But you also get, you know, like this, um, this database on your own players. Um, it is okay if I just share the screen again, so uh, maybe it's easier to explain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one second.
like like I said before. Um, this is not in this. Uh, you can, you can't see it here, but imagine that if you have taken uh, twenty kicks in a training, then the twenty kicks will be uh, will be put in as a lot of balls, and then you can see you know, like your your scoring um, counting, and you could see it week after week after week. That means that you uh, you're nearly making a diary of his uh, direct free kick uh, process. And that's very motivating for a player to see how much he develops, for example, in, in six weeks or in two months. Uh, some players, they can develop very, very fast. Um, and, and they can see, you know, like I had, I had one player who took two trainings, then he was able to do it. And of course, he was so motivated because he knew what kind of weapon this was for the games. Um, then I have players, you know, like where it took a little bit longer, but because I had measured it and because I have this uh, data, then I can took him by side and say, and you know, as, as also, of course, the video, I can tell him, you know, like that's where we started and look where you are now. And then it's just small technical details to make sure that he makes a clear top spinner or if it's a delivery for a corner kick, a side spinner or what it could be. Uh, all these small details, you just can get data feedback. Um, and in the, in the beginning, when I was teaching set piece takers, it was all, always with a block, you know, like, and I take notes, my own notes. But the way it's visualized is just, it's just better. It's just more quality. And it's easier for you to a co as a coach to say, take a look at this video in slow motion. Look here. That's why you get the side spin instead of the top spin. Maybe you should put a toe down or what it could be, or maybe you should increase your movement here to get more power, for example. All these small details, the system is giving you that. And I'm not working for them. So it's not because, you know, like uh, I get some money for that, for saying that. It's just, I think it's just a, a nice tool. Uh, and I really like to work with it because it makes it easier. And it makes it also you know, like the players, they were so motivated. An example on the academy, we had um, sprint testing 30 meter. We have an uh, indoor hall, sprint testing 30 meter. And after that 30 meter, you know, like you have made, made maybe five sprints. Normally you um, play a little, with the, little bit with the ball and then you go inside. Instead of that, I put this up. And then I said, if somebody, if somebody would like to come over and kick a little bit and get some feedback and some practice, then you're welcome. Imagine how many players coming over after they have run or are taking the sprints. So it's also the fun of it. You don't, you don't find a, a player who is not like, I would like to take a free kick. You don't find them. They love it. And they love it even more if you're standing there and you're filming it and you're trying to make them better. That's, that's clear. I don't know a player maybe a goalkeeper, but, but other players, you know, like if it's central defender, if it's midfielder, if it's attacker, they love it. And of course, then the idea, the next step could be to take this, um, this value board, the scoring opportunity window, and then you hang it up in the basement or in the dressing room so that they can compete against each other. And also because then when you have a game, it should not be a discussion on the pitch Who's taking the free kick now? It should just be okay. You have the best opportunity to score, you take it. And at some point, at the under 19 team, under 17 team, we reached that level where the players said on the pitch, okay, this one, in this, uh, in this place, you are better than me. And then they took it. So it, it can help with, with a lot of stuff, not just, you know, like technical uh, motivation. But also in the hierarchy, in the free kick hierarchy, and, and that's important. And like I said before, imagine that in five years in the Premier League, in the Bundesliga, every team will have these free kick specialists. The question is just if you can create that culture in the team and in the club where the best free kick taker is going to take the free kick or not. And it's not any, any star coming over and saying, you, you just, you, you're 19 or you're 20, you go away, I'm 28, I've played a final in the Champions League or, or some stuff like that. It should, it should be the quality that decides who's taking this free kick. 
or who's taking this penalty or what it could be. I mean, Serge, on that, I mean, how do you have tools that are sort of enable you to work with the players? I guess what we're looking here with, with, with Mads is you want, you know, you want consistency with the delivery, whether it's from a corner or from a, from a, a free kick. Yeah. Yeah. You want consistency. So yeah. A day before the game, uh, it's always a practice 11 v 11 and, um, the, the guy who delivers it, uh, at the, at the start of the week, we've got in the afternoon individual uh, sessions, uh, and he likes to go out again. And then, yeah, we don't have that technical tools at the moment, but uh, yeah, I just try to put, uh, some mannequins, uh, in the, in the hit zones. Um, or that flatable uh, uh, mannequins, and then yeah, he, he tries to hit that one, um, yeah, just to get um, I say it, consistency in his kicking. Uh, most of the times after we do 11 v 11, uh, they the, the boys play uh, uh, small sided games, and uh, sometimes when it doesn't go well, he wants to get back that feeling. And he goes on his own and, and he starts over and, tr and tries again to, to hit the areas. Um, so, yeah, not that much uh, technology technology yet, uh, but everything is recorded. So I can, uh, can uh, yeah, every time uh, show them. So most of the times I watch WhatsApp them individually, like, okay, uh, uh, we did this 11 v 11, uh, watch you run. And then our analyst uh, draw in the... In the, in the footage and then they said oh, you were too early or you were too late or or yeah uh, and then show them individually and then uh, yeah that's that's what i do with the technology at the moment and in terms of free kick takers riches with uh you would you bother going into the technique um and showing it for for the goalkeepers with a or maybe just with with particular uh, free kick, take, kick takers, as, as Mad says, there's a lot of clubs who it's it's basically whoever grabs hold of the ball first, rather than there is a real designated specialist free kick taker. Um, I think generally with information on direct free kicks, I'd probably be working with like really closely with Serge, and it maybe wouldn't be something that would necessarily. I mean, you can show it to the whole team in terms of look if we're gonna again we need to avoid giving free kicks away in this area, guys, because if we do, then you know they've got X player. But I guess normally it would be I'd probably work a bit closer with a goalkeeping coach on that one and be like, look, they've got this guy who's going to shoot. He's going to shoot with power from 40 metres. I don't know, like a, a David Luiz-esque uh, style or someone like that. Then I think that's really important to highlight highlight that to the uh, to the goalkeeping coach. Um, but in terms of the technology, I think a, a big part of it from my point of view is obviously you can you have the video. Absolutely. You know, it's really important for players to see. Um, what they've done and, and, and that type of thing. But I think as well, especially if you're working with a team where you've got a lot of um, different nationalities and maybe somebody who's new to the country or, you know, whatever it is, I think being able to highlight spaces on a football pitch or, you know, highlighting certain movements with uh, a spotlight or, a, you know, a little tracker under the player, I think that's common language for everybody. And I think the, the telestration tools that are available, you know, if you're able to use them, are just really helpful tool in terms of making information and messages clearer for, for everybody because it's universal language. Yeah, on the direct, on the, sorry, Steve, on the direct free kick, Steve. Yeah, so what Richard is saying, like, okay, you show to the goalkeeper coach, uh, and it's depending on how you want to set up for the direct free kick. Um, so is it just a, a side spin or? Um, is it, for example, last Friday we played against the team, he had a little bit, I think it's called a knuckleball, so it moves uh, a, a lot. So that's something I show to the team as well then, um, because what's very important, it's a, a lot of goalkeepers try to catch the ball, and I think that's the problem, because yeah, I said, listen, your first job is to not concede the goal, yeah, so you need to stop it. And of course, you, you try to catch it, but because... The free kick moves, it's so difficult. So you kind of give away a rebound. So all the other players uh, need to be aware that, that probably if he shoots on target, there will be a rebound. So they need to react. And then it's very important for that footage to, to show them to the, to the whole team. Richard, 
Brilliant. I think um, finally then, guys, to, to wrap it up, um, from uh, all three of you, obviously, uh, watch and observe a lot of set-piece routines and set-piece takers. Um, yeah, who are the individual players or, or teams that are, that are catching your eye at the moment in terms of what they're doing with set pieces? Um, from my point of view, obviously, I'm spending a lot of time watching uh, Belgian football at the moment. And um, obviously, just before this started, we, we were talking a little bit there. And I was saying the team in Belgium, um, it's basically the same owners that own Leicester City called uh, Leuven. Um, you can see that this is a team that's putting in a lot of effort on their set pieces. They've got a lot of different short movements and, and those type of things. So from my point of view, obviously, spending a hell of a lot of my time watching Belgian football at the moment, um, Leuven in Belgium. They've just come up from the second division as well. It's the first first time in the, in the top division for a long time. There, you can see that they're putting in some good work on, on set pieces. Uh, the teams I watch at the moment is like, yeah, Bayer Leverkusen. Uh, they, I think they changed. They were not that successful. And this season, they're more successful with uh, corner kicks. Uh, I watch FC Michelin as well. Uh, Atletico Madrid. Um, yeah, that are the teams where I look at at the moment. Yeah, I find that uh, West Ham, they're pretty interesting. Uh, the same as Everton. Southampton, of course. But Southampton, they have scored like uh, nine, nine goals, but three of them is a direct free kick. Um, and I'm watching a lot of German Bundesliga. So, of course, Leverkusen, nine, nine, nine goals after the corner kicks is, is pretty much, uh, like I said before, Gladbach. And then um, also Leipzig on the free kicks and Frankfurt. That's, that's where I'm looking. Um, and then, of course, there's sometimes, I think that, that many clubs, they have seen the opportunity for, for the set pieces. And... There are many clubs trying new things, and they are very close to make it uh, to make it perfect. So sometimes you will see a play from uh, from one team, and then afterwards they are not that much um, to look after. But they 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 come in with with with, the, with these single plays. So it's just a question about when do they make a, a whole playbook instead of just doing it once and then three weeks after do it once again. So I think that many are on their way, but it's uh, it's also a question about uh, being consistent and demand demand that you you need the quality every week and not just sometimes. Okay, fantastic! I think that's a uh, a great place to to wrap it up for today. So yeah, I'd just like to say a big thanks to to Mads. Yes, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to be here and very nice to meet uh, you and Serge and uh, Richard. I'm going to follow your teams, you can be sure. <laughs> okay. Well, Serge is confident. Look, he's happy with that. Uh, I'm going <laughs> oh, to steal every single play I can see and then <laughs> I'm going to go for the details. And when, when some details are not fitting into my, to my hit, then I'm going to call. Yeah, no problem. Let's say a big thanks to Serge. Yeah, sorry, mate. Your, your secrets are out. Yeah, you're welcome. Nice to share and uh, get the knowledge from the other ones as well. And uh, if you've got any comments uh, when you see all my set pieces that we can do better, please let me know. <laughs> as an open invitation. And then, uh, Richard, yeah, thanks for joining us today. No, thank you for having me. As I say, it's always good to speak to, you know, it's, I think in football, sometimes people aren't always willing to share. And it's nice to speak to open-minded people who are willing to, you know, share ideas because that's how things progress and the game moves forward. So it's been a pleasure to speak to everyone today. Here, here. Fine words to finish this Sunday session on. Thanks, guys.